Shalom, everybody, and welcome to the Yishai Fleischer Show, broadcasting live from Yerushalayim, Ir HaKodesh, Jerusalem, the holy city, the wonderful city, the beautiful city, filled with so many beautiful and awesome things, including the Pardes Institute here in Talpio, Jerusalem. Rabbi Mike Boyer joins us. Shalom, Rabbi Mike. Oh, shalom. Good to see you, Jack. It's good to see you, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a stunningly gorgeous day out there, uh, beautiful fall-like, fall-like yes. cool, uh, but it's already, like... It's already supposed we to be raining. Past the fall thing, right? We should be past the fall and thing. I would say somewhat disturbingly beautiful day yeah, out there. Yeah, and and uh, you and I were just hashing some of the challenges that the state of Israel and the state of the world uh, is at right now. Uh, something bothered me yesterday very much, and and I got to get through it quickly because we've got to get to the parsha, very big parsha of Toldo. Lots of amazing depth and action there. Lots of prophecy that that is meaningful. Big stuff. Yeah, big stuff. Um, just uh, this morning, I heard about Jews going to the tomb of uh, Yosef. Mm-hmm. Jews continue to go to the tomb of Joseph, you know, and and they do it under cover of night into the big Arab city of Shechem, Shechem or Nablus. It's got three ways of saying it, really. Um, and uh, we call it Shechem. The Arabs call it Nablus, which is a Roman name, Neo- Neapolis, Neopolis. And, um, uh, you know they were they were attacked savagely with Molotov cocktails. Ooh. The uh, uh, the army repelled with rubber bullets and gas and and uh, what's it called uh, riot riot right response. Here. Yeah, uh, to to this and and I I just you know I, I wrote today on Twitter. I'm like, look, th- this is what the Palestinian national movement is about. It's it's really about repressing both our it's about ethnic cleansing, and then it's about repressing our history and erasing our history and rewriting a map and oh, making yeah. it a different map and. And uh, and uh, we're in the throes of a, of a battle out there. And then I got a I got a video from Hebron about how the army responded to a similar situation. Hebron, very weak response. I saw our boys. Can I use that term, or is that like a old term, like old, like our our fighters? Yeah, no. you know, like just just being ordered to have this weak response. And uh, and you could see this this very milquetoast response to extreme violence, which which in the end, then you and I discussed this right before the show. You made the point to say, you know, look, this is educating the next generation of, of terrorists as well, which means at the end, more deaths on on our side and our their side. It's the classic case of penny smart, pound foolish. Meaning, I can understand why the army and the political sort of uh, decisions behind it would take a weak response because they don't want the local problem, they want the media, etc. But in the end of the day. That's under the assumption that this problem would just go away if we let it. Right. But the reality is, as you're pointing out, is we're in the middle of a war. And I think the, we were speaking before the show about the need to, to face the crisis in, in government. But I think more than anything else, and I've begun to do this to my students who, most of them being North Americans, don't look at life this way. Just say as often as you can, by the way, we're in the middle of war. War. It's a hundred year war. Right. We're in war. That's right. We have a tendency to think, oh, but there aren't tanks and this and that. You know, no, no, sorry. Like, we're in the middle of war, and when you're in the middle of war, you need to bring to bear your whole self as an individual and your culture yep. to achieve victory, which means you need some clarity on what it is you're trying to do. Yeah, I keep talking about cl- clarity as one of the key words. But it works that way. I think the reason that we don't want to talk about the fact that we're in war is that we as a society lack any clarity of vision. Right. Plus the fact that our, our governmental system is hanging fire now. And uh, and so it's easier to pretend, no, we're not at war. This is a disturbance. It's a, no, it's a dispute. It's a, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to work out some modus vivendi. Uh, you know, that sounds nice, but I actually don't think it's true. Mm-hmm. And certainly, we know our enemies don't think it's true. Right. They're at war. They're at full war. <laughs> yeah. And and that whole myth that it takes two to tango. Yeah. It, well, that's because, you know, tango is actually a productive act. It's a dance. It only takes one person, person to get the stuff and beat out of them. <laughs> you know, like, like it's a, it's not, I'm not really looking for that. So we need to choose our posture, I think. Yeah. And Daniel Pipes, as Professor Daniel Pipes, has written a lot about this concept the whole of victory, uh, movement. victory movement. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you know, I have to say that wh- while on, on the one hand I think it's a little uh, – it's, it's not like a full discourse of it, but it's – But it's, uh, but it's the, an important it's counterpoint important, yeah. to, like, the peace movement. Right, right. right? Which, which is based on the assumption that we're tired and we're going to just have to concede and retreat. And I don't even know if we're tired. We're, uh, and m- when my, my sense is more than tiredness is, again, back to clarity, back to inner narrative. It, it dawned on me – Sometimes the simplest things dawn on me, you know, like sometimes like, oh, this is, you know, my, this is my right hand, this is my left hand, like, 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 <laughs> Ooh, you know, like, my toes. Yeah, yeah, like <laughs> the simplest things dawn on me. Here, here's what dawned on me. It, it might seem simple, but it's actually not. Law 
is a product of narrative. Oh, yes. Right? Like you create laws, your society create oh, laws yes. as a product of what its values are, which are as a product of its narrative. Yes. And so I'm constantly feeling it's not that we're tired. Our inner narrative is unclear. It's yes. just this, they it's don't confused. know it. And, and, and I'll just add but one that more point. It produces exhaustion. Yes, right. Lack of clarity, bad policy, all that, uh, you, you know, and, 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 and uh, you know, then throw in a, a heap of uh, world criticism that produces exhaustion. Plus some major baggage from the last 2000 years. Right. That, that definitely produces, pr produces exhaustion. But what I what I've come to um, a, a smaller conclusion in my mind is that one of the biggest if, if I could if I could throw in uh, a panacea into this mix it would be a greater affinity and connection to the Tanakh. Yes. Because the Tanakh is the source of our narrative. <laughs> I'm saying things that are simple, but these things that are, are like, they're absolutely key. Like, if I ask my friends in the army, when I'm sitting with them in a Jeep in the middle of the night on the, on the Carmel Hill of Haifa, and I say, hey, what Tanakh story took place here? Which the most famous story of of Elijah the prophet yes. coming to this mountain, bringing down fire. It's it's a it's a seminal, seminal and beautiful story. And they're like, I don't know. And if I start telling them the story, they're not like, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. They have no idea. You're like, well, how could you possibly know that you're supposed to fight for this mountain? You're supposed to know that your prophets are from this mountain, and that your stories are from this mountain. And I don't even mean religiously, although that would be, of course, the better level. But even as a national story, a national mythology. And by the way, the religiously goes to the heart of the fact that it's not just the Tanakh that we need to connect to. The, the, the interplay between narrative and law in the mind of our sages is very important as well. This is, by the way, the keystone of kind of everything I do in my right. teaching, the Jewish story. They, there is no law without narrative. Right. If you want to understand what's happened to Western society, there's a reason that the postmodern era is defined by what they call the death of the grand narrative. Right? All the narratives that held together Western society, the religious, the sort of uh, secular, philosophical, the political, all those narratives that gave guidance, which gave a justification for the application of law in, a, in sometimes harsh and sometimes other ways, have collapsed. And you can see a society out there which is trying to adjudicate with, without any underlying structure. We, we are facing, though, in the, in the Israel v. Arab world v. Palestine battle, they are very sharp on narrative. Yes. Very good. By the way, this morning when I was watching World War II in color, to relax, um, <laughs> uh, one of the things that I saw is that Goebbels, one of the things that he did was that he made these certain radios very, very cheap practically handing them out but guess what they had one channel ah. they had one channel and everybody tuned in and and with with uh he just kept on genius yeah absolutely absolutely brilliant guy you could see it on him and super motivated and um and he kept feeding them it, it took 10 years of anti-semitic teachings to bring out all german anti-semitism to you know for, to see that the jews Ooh. the bolsheviks and all that are one and the same thing we've got to we've got to destroy these people so to the point where you actually get them killing 12,000 people a day at the height of auschwitz right that's right so so but 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 it was a taught thing you know what i mean yeah. and, and you, you propaganda so so we're you, when when you have narrative weakness and you're facing somebody who's got narrative and in our clarity clarity and and push yes and and, and is good at narrative warfare you're at a disadvantage. The great, you see the great proof of this is the, the victory of the language of occupation. I mean, I remember we were joking when I first started in the post-Yeshiva world. So I'm thinking about right now, say 2003, 2004. That's 15 years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like our big joke was about Hanan Ashrawi, right? That, that, uh, that anytime you would ask her what time it was, she'd look at her watch and say, it is time to end the occupation. Right. right? Meaning there's only one message. Right. And you just keep repeating it in yeah. every possible sense. And they've installed that language into a whole generation of not just the American sort of more liberal left world of Judaism. But even here we've adopted our, our own government has adopted it. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I, have a, I have a simple solution, by the way. Careful uh, with that word. <laughs> no, I, I have a relatively simple solution for the problem of occupation. Yeah, uh, I have a simple solution for the problem of occupation. Here's, here's what it is. Now, my friends, my friends on the nationalist side of the map here in Israel, they think that the answer to the answer to occupation narrative is the sovereignty narrative. Uh -huh. I get that, and I'm I'm all for it. I'm yeah. one hundred thousand percent behind I'm aware. that. We've, we've discussed. I'm all good with with sovereignty. I believe I'm, that. I'm I think, down with sovereignty as well. But I think that there's an intermediary step that can be taken immediately that would would alleviate a lot of this tension, and that is to change the name when we talk about the territories, etc. 
the occupation, we just start calling it the Israeli territories, i.e., Israel is holding on to some territories, like America right. has territories. But instead of calling it the territories or occupy, just say the Israeli territories. We see them as the Israeli territories. They are non annexed Israeli territories that we will hopefully, maybe one day in the future, that's like, true. That's right, over. Like Puerto Rico. Like, okay, y maybe it's never going to be a state, or maybe it will, but it's never going to be independent Puerto Rico. It's going to be, you know, America. And and maybe that's not the best uh, example. But the simple the simple fact is is that countries, big countries, hold on to territories. They're their territories. So we're, if we just change the language of adding that word, the Israeli territories. Yeah, I mean, it's I think that it's the, a small measure. It's a small measure. But it also go back to the, the whole narrative question. Then part of that also is we need to shift the language around speaking about the Arabs who live between the Jordan and the sea. Right. Right. Okay. So uh, Arabs, are, Israeli are, Arabs, are, Palestinians, uh, right. citizens. Uh, residents. residents, like I mean, this is a, this is not only a language, but 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 a um, but like a deep question, like how do we relate? I've I I think that there's you know I've said this a long time ago. There's 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 residency. That's one way of looking at it. Another way is citizen of Jordan. I would bring Jordan back into this picture, especially that Jordan's so critical of us. You know, it's like you know. I what? said that on that panel, by the way. I literally someone pointed out to me. I said we should drag Jordan into this discussion by its nostrils. Right. I was like, ooh, I said that. <laughs> You know, okay, so there, you know, and there, and there was a, there was an Arab flying in Hebron. There was an Arab flying a giant, giant Jordanian flag, and it served my purposes so well. And it, it came down. You know how it is there. Uh, it came down, but it was a huge, humongous. I'm talking about, you know, uh, I don't Big. know, f five by six meters, like a right, huge yeah, flag. Yeah. And now, now it's gone. But it was great. I kept. I, I I said to people, look at that flag. They'd be like, yeah, it's a flag of Palestine. I'm like, no, look at that little star. It's the flag of Jordan. Okay, and that was and that was very good. I'm like, these are Jordanians. These are Jordanian Palestinian Arabs living here as Israeli residents, potentially. Yeah. People are like, okay, all right, uh, we got to get to uh, the Torah portion. Right, we just yeah. had to get that out of the way. Yeah, and I want to say that I, I love this Torah portion. It's got it's got fabulous, fabulous narrative, fabulous stories, and um, and also fabulous characters. The fabulous characters that really this is their Torah portion, and that is Yitzchak and Rivka, this amazing couple. And I've said this many times before, Rivka is one of my favorite characters in the Torah. At every, every single verse of hers is forthright and clarity and decision making. Mm -hmm. Every verse that she's in is like this, do this, I'm going to do this. I'll show it to you as, as we go along. And then there's Yitzchak, a type of silent person who doesn't talk too much. I've come to respect Yitzchak in, in, in my reading as, as a kind of man who is strong and silent, like does go ahead and moves ahead, very cunning, very witty, very kind of smart, but without without a lot of words, laconic. Mm -hmm. Okay, keeps it kind of keeps it inside. He's definitely a classic laconic character. Right. He, but 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 I've I've there's little 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 kind of uh, uh, signs in the text to show that he's he's there's there. A, you know, there's also an otherworldliness about him. Right. And I, and I think that that you know that whole question of what the world would look like after coming down off the altar. Right. Right. Needs to be kept in sort of full square. Right. Focus when we're looking at his character through this, right. because because he made it halfway into the next world, right? Yeah. He was almost there. He was almost taken uh, at the binding. The 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 Jewish liturgy around that is that he did die at the binding, yeah, right? and, and his, that his ashes, ashes stay before are before God all the time, right? So, which is another way of saying that whoever he was beforehand, it's not who he was after, right? And then we have the other two characters of Yitzcha, of of Yaakov and Esav, and we're going to meet them, and they are both. Intense rich. dudes, yeah, they're intense rich, dudes. Rich. All right, let's right. get there. Let's get right to it. So let's open up the book. We're chapter twenty-five. Torah portion is called Toldot and Bereshit Lamed Chavhe, and um, twenty-five. Twenty-five. All right, here we go. Uh, let's let's see where, where we're going to start. First, we'll start with the praying. It turns out that Yitzchak and Rivka pray for twenty years to have a child, and it says that. Um, and this is the first time, by the way, in the Torah that anybody prays for a child. Other times you argue for a child. Other times you ask for a sign for a child beforehand. This time, okay? They both pray. The, 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 the Rashi says the rationale why God answered his specific prayer for uh, for um, for children is because he's the son of a righteous person himself. Rif was also righteous, but but she's a daughter of not such righteous folks. We'll learn about that later. And then these two, it turns out that there's twins in her stomach, Wait, in I, her womb. Go ahead. Don't just blow by the Go fact ahead. that the whole Parsha opens with this problem of barrenness because it's right. worth it to point out that, that Sarah, Rivka, 
and Rachel right. were all barren. Right. At that Hannah, in terms of like the biblical arc of barren women, and it obviously poses a question: it's like, why do the great female leaders of our people suffer from barrenness when the primary command that we get at the beginning of the book of Genesis is to be fruitful and multiply. Mm -hmm. And the answer is in the deeper aspect of what you just said is that what God wants out of the world is not just natural process. What God wants out of the world is consciousness and the height of expression of consciousness is prayer. Right. And, and so, so what does it mean that he was Tzadik Ben Tzadik and that's why his prayers were answered? Is that, is that Rachel wanted a child because she wanted a child. Sorry, um, Rivka wanted a child because she wanted a child. And she was righteous, so therefore she wanted a good child. She wanted a child that was going to serve God. She knew that it was God's will. Yitzchak, on some level, wanted God's will to be mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. And he knew that God's will was that he have a child. So that's a deeper expression of this power of consciousness. It's, I don't just want for me. That's fine. I I'll say what you just said, but I'll, I'll add a tiny twist, which is a silent actor in this whole Torah portion is Avraham. Yes. Which is who's going to pass on the thing of Abraham? Who's going to? So that's that's why Rashi said Sadik Ben Sadik. Like the real issue here is Yitzchak saying again, like like Avraham did. Like, am I going to have that child to pass it on? Am I going to have that ability? Who's going to Who's going to take the the mantle of Abraham? And that's precisely my point. I mean, it's not just the fact that he's a father and he wants, or he wants to be a father and have his own child. He's saying no. There's a There's a plan here. Right. God, we got to get this plan moving forward. And that's Sadik Ben Sadik. It's right. not just about him. It's about like you said, his the intergenerational right. uh, mission. That, that he represents for Am Yisrael. Well, he, just just tiny parentheses here. That's exactly what we were talking about earlier. If you read the Tanakh and feel yourself, and here I'll quote Yehuda Cohen, to be an, a character in the Tanakh, yes. you feel yourself to be part of that. So you're like, okay, I've got to be that Abrahamic presence in this world. I've there's, got to I've bring that. Yeah, there's a mission which needs to be fulfilled. Okay. Uh, the, the, the sons um, struggled. struggled in her womb, inside of her. And he, she says, here's another one of these Rivka lines. Yeah. Notice, she says, she says, if so, why is this for me? Why is this happening to me? Right. I mean, Very, what's the message here? Right. And me. Like, I'm yeah. in charge. Like, yep. I, this is about me and I got to make a decision. Vatelech, she goes, She goes to... Uh, to the prophet. Well, that's... Or, or, or she just asks God. Yeah, she right. Uh, I know for for some reason I'm not exactly clear why. I know that Chazal say here that she went to speak to a prophet. To me, I, I don't I don't see any reason to say that. Where in this verse and the next verse, it's clear that God speaks to her directly. Okay, we can come up with all kinds of reasons why no that's but okay, fine. No problem. But the point is, is that she goes to demand. That's Lidrosh has two meanings, which is to uh, unearth and to figure out, and also to demand right. of God. Like, something's happening to me, I want to know why. That's it, what her face is. And it's very important. If a person wants to understand the world, you have to accept the fact that our assumptions define our conclusions. She lives in a world in which she knows that everything comes from God. So right. Therefore, what's happening to her is a question to God and not just just to the doctor, so right. to speak. And and, and, and the element that, that she's asking about is the strugulation. That's a word I just made up. It was a, yeah, the, a good one. The, the, the struggling. The, the struggle. The, 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 <laughs> she's experiencing. Yeah. No, but it's not just there's – they are struggling. Yes. What is the deal with them? Yes. That's what she's really asking. Yes, like, yes, what yes. is her – the struggle? Not like why do I have twins or something like that. Like, what's going on inside? So God says to her here, – here again, says, Vayom Rashem La says to her – Okay, so two two nations are within your womb, and and two kind of kingdoms or nations or however or or. Well, it, 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 but those are very. It's a very important distinction between goy and luum here. Okay, let's let's go. Right, goy is is a peoplehood. People. Yeah, it's a peoplehood, and luumim aren't nations. Right, which is why you use that word kingdom because malchut. If you look right. into the translations in the commentary. What's the difference? A people is is a story. It's a narrative. It's a culture. The Malchut is its political, physical embodiment in the world. And this is a very important vision that she receives. That, that, that you, First of all, there are two competing narratives inside you right now. And they're going to have two physical manifestations in the world. But what, notice, the, you can have the two goyim in whatever relationship you want. But what does it say? Ulu'um. But those two kingdoms, if you want them to actually have their physical manifestation of fullness in the world, nah, they're going to struggle, and one's going to serve the other. Right. And that goes to the heart of what we were speaking about. Right, and this, who's going to serve who can be read both ways. The many will subjugate the, the young, or the many will be the servant of the young. Meaning to say, it's a little bit, there's a, there's a play there. There's a play, although it's 
easiest to read as that the old the elder will serve the younger. right but i heard from from uh i heard from rabbi at shalom that that really no, you can both ways no, for sure and, and it's and and that plays into the whole idea of that and we'll get it at the end of the parsha that it can reverse if if the jews are not doing the thing right then the the other powers can control them i mean it's important to know that this is the beginning of narrative warfare right right Absolutely. It, is, it is the origin and the christian church will fight this battle down arguably depending on which part of the church you're speaking about even today so who's the elder and the younger right between Yaakov and Esau or between the Jews and the Christians is right. a rather hot topic mm -hmm. down through time yeah yeah a lot of times when I'm at the the Marat Machpelah I tell people that one of the greatest battles here at Marat Machpelah and so too on the Temple Mount is on the Temple Mount is who is God's favorite and that's why other religions and other peoples have tried to establish a temple mount, a temple there of, so, of sorts. And at, in, in Hebron, the battle is who's Abraham's chosen? Who's Abraham's yeah. favorite son? Right. And that's the battle. And if you're like a total secularist and you're like, why can't we just have peace? You're like, you don't, you don't get what's right. going on here. Okay? Do, do you have any siblings? Right. <laughs> okay. So then the, the, the two, uh, these two gentlemen emerge. Uh, first is, uh, is this reddish one, right? And he's wearing a red tie. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the first one comes out red and he is he is uh, like like a mantle of of hair like a coat wearing like a coat like vikuchmo esav and you mention this every year yep. as though he's fully created already a fully made man fully yep. fully established yep and therefore his experience from birth is that he's self-made he doesn't have the process of interacting with the world. And therefore, the rest of his life, he's running around trying to maintain right. that selfhood, which is why he's aif. He's, you know, worn out and tired, right? And why he's all about seizing and doing and achieving, because that has to sort of, like, maintain that sense of, of like, it's only downhill from here. Mm -hmm. if I don't maintain it. Whereas Yaakov has a whole process of growing into selfhood, which is quite long. <laughs> we, we see it. It's going to take a number of parts out here. That's interesting, and uh, I, I need to, to, to spend some time thinking about that some more. In any case, his brother uh, uh, his brother emerges, and he's holding on to the ankle uh, of Esav. Esav already has a name, right? The, the name is already sticking to him, and just as he emerges, he's already like an Esav. That, and Look this him, one, like, whoa, he's right, done. And, and, the, and he's coming out with holding on to his heel. That is that is some graphic image. Veikra uh, Shmo Yaakov, and they called him Yaakov. Uh, and that was his name. Now they uh, they separate immediately in that in that Esav becomes a person who knows the hunt. He's a man of the field, while Jacob Yaakov each time Yosef Yaakov is a simple man or whole man who sits in tents. In, in what does that mean? Sits in tents. Yaakov is intense. Intense. He's intense. What does that mean? Do you know any Jews? Yeah, they're intense for <laughs> sure. Uh, I love it when my Gentile friends come over. They're like, "Are you guys always like this?" I'm like, like what? <laughs> yeah, like, what do you mean? Why yeah. dress that? <laughs> uh, but he is a man who sits in tents. What does that? What does that mean? Does that mean that he that he's a, that he's studious? That's what uh, Rashi says that he is a, a man of the uh, Rashi the for Torah. sure that he's the, the the plural. Rashi's focus on the on the you know the tents of Shem the Ever and this idea that there was a process of of learning divine will even before the Torah was given. Which I would never disparage, but I think that the simple meaning there is that um, he's he's not cooked yet, right? You know, the Asel comes out ready to go, right? Hits the ground running, he's full hair, each of the field, you know, hunting, etc. Yaakov is a little bit bemused. Mm -hmm. He's like, I'm not really sure. I want to stay here in the tent. Mm -hmm. And what I'm ready to go out there in the world. Tom, what does it mean, Tom? Because so, so, what is, it means whole or perfect or it simple. It also just means simple, meaning right. yeah, he's he, he's not ready for the world. Because what we're going to encounter pretty soon is a Yaakov that knows how to be wily. Oh, yes. As opposed to a kind of a Tom. He is a, a kind of a player. A he's, kind of, he is the classic trickster in that, res that right. respect. And, and, and even the deceiver in, in many ways. And it's going to raise a lot of questions about... Oh, oh, well, I don't know. I, you don't even know. So we'll see the deception is Rifka's. So we'll see that in a bit. But here we're going to, well, let's just get right well, to it. You can't completely whitewash him from right. that. But, but let's get right to it, which is, okay, he's going to catch Asav at a weak moment, mm -hmm. which is, which is, which is a fair way of warfare, right? It's like, it's like, it's like. All's fair. All's fair. I always say like when, when the Gentiles want to kill the Jews, you know, they around us up in camps and they gas us and they burn us. And then they take our property. When the Jews want to take the the Gentiles' property, we establish 
casinos okay <laughs> and we say have a good time nobody wants to kill you have fun just give the, the money over okay so nice uh, <laughs> nice he shy who cut that out of the show <laughs> no but here's the point here's exactly the point listen what happens right he comes to him and 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 he's cooking up a stew, yeah, a, a good smelling mm, stew, mm, mm. right? It's a yummy stew. And remember, he's a he's a he's a he's mama's a man. Boy. He's a mama's boy. He's sitting in the tents. So here he is, and he and he's cooking up a sweet smelling stew. It doesn't say sweet smelling, but I'm adding that in because it's Asaph, savory. It was definitely it's savory. Because Asaph is stew. coming from the field, and he's tired. It says so, and he's tired. And tired, by the way, here means hungry. Okay, like yeah. out of energy. Yeah, oh yeah. Okay, so so Asaph says to Yaakov, Asaph, look who turns to who. He doesn't sell it to him. He's like, oh, give me some of that or pour down my throat some of that very red. Red, red stew. Red, red stew. Right? Because I'm tired or hungry. Therefore, they called his name Edom. Right? By the way, I one time, I think I told you the story. Yeah. One time I needed, I, I was in, in a break from law school and I was in Florida in some place and uh, in a motel and it was Shabbat and I was like on a hammock or something. And I hear these right. people reading the Bible. And I just go, I, I had a hat on. I look like a drunk. I, I'm telling you. <laughs> Never. I, walk, I walked up and I was like, can I, can I sit? With, it was Shabbat. And I was by myself. I was like, can I sit with you? And they were like, it was like a biblical moment. They're like, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, I just love to hear the Bible read. So they're like, so there was this verse. And they go, and, there, and they called his name Edom. And, and no, no English sense. So I said, them, Edom means red. Edom means red. So they're like, oh, how do you know that? Like, Teach us, Jew. I'm like, I'm like, I'm from Israel. They're like, oh, my God, praise the Lord. Okay. <laughs> and thus the truth has arrived That's in the form right. of a drunken Jew. Right. I was not drunk. I was just very tired. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so Yaakov says, uh, sure, I'll give you some of the soup. Sell me your birthright. What's it worth to you? What's brother? Right? So, so Asaph makes a very reasonable calculation. He says, here, I'm going to die. I'm very, very hungry. Why do I need a birthright for it? What do I need a ephemeral thing? When Abstract need, for right, future abs versus immediate gain. Immediate real gain, real tangible gain. Who knows? By the way, I heard also, he, he, he says here, I'm going to die. I heard Rabbi Shalom say, I'm in a um, very um, uh, dangerous way of life, in a risky way of life. I'm a hunter. I'm out there. I, 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 could, get, no I, could, right. I could get eaten by a lion tomorrow. And, you know, and so my whole life is, I don't know about the... We all die someday. It right, could be tomorrow. Right. And I don't, I don't necessarily know that if I'm going to have, a, you know, any, any need for this thing. So it says, uh, but Yaakov says, uh, you know, taking it one step further, make an oath for me. And he makes an oath and he, and he uh, sold him the birthright. And then... By the way, I just point out that, that taking it one step further is also, um, is, is part of the depth of this process. Because Yaakov wants to just point out, it's one thing... Yeah, yeah, like I'll get the birthright. Yeah, like giving into his appetite. Yaakov's just pointing out to him, wait, bind yourself. Right. If you're like, going to make this decision, make a real decision right now. Right. You know, and, and in many ways, even though some people like to see this as like a like the underhanded part of the that's story. That's what I'm saying. It's not underhanded. He. That's what I'm Yaakov saying. Yaakov says, like, wait, are you sure that it's actually worth it to you? Right. And he doesn't <laughs> remember. He doesn't offer it to him in the beginning. It's first. He's just making a stew. And yeah. comes a seven and is like, I want this to say. Oh, this isn't the part that I see to be underhanded. Right. Right. Okay, we'll get we'll get to the other hand. But it, it's the same thing with the casino. It's like, listen, you don't you don't so have to go. Everybody knows what goes. Yeah, on you know what goes here. on in here. You don't have to go into this thing. Okay. Uh, uh, all I right. just want to point out the reason my hesitation there is because there's a real disease. There's a disease that's being preyed on there. That's true. No, and, that, I, and that's that's the problem I have. I I, I agree with you. I I and we have that here in Israel as well. The lottery stuff. I I I. I, I I walked into a store. I think I told you this. I walk into a store and I looked around one of these stores that sells lottery, cigarettes, sugary snacks, and booze probably, and, and booze, and and I'm just like, and I looked at the guy who was a religious Jew, and I'm like, you're a drug dealer. That's what I told him. I'm like, everything you sell here is drugs. Every All single thing. Addiction. Yeah. Oh, and he had the oh, and he had the sports on TV. Right. I'm like, you. That's what you're. You're just a. You're just a legitimate drug dealer. Yep. Look at your whole store. It's all drugs. It's yeah. all addictions. Shemi Shmerino. And he was he was just like he looked at me like I was nuts and I'm like look look at everything you're selling it's all it's all just stuff to get you addicted and there's nothing there's nothing life giving right nothing <laughs> life giving in their whole store yeah except for the water okay no I agree with you and, and I appreciate that you pointed that out I appreciate that you pointed that out although a lot of people do go to casinos are not addicted I, I said it, that it's, there's a disease that's being preyed on I mean people yeah. don't go to the casino it, and it's definitely and have, not have fun and entertain themselves yeah. 
that's not my issue. Right. My issue is that the, the, that's not where Casino makes its money. Right. Casino makes its money off of the people that it's preying on. That's right. That's right. Okay. Uh, anyway, now a camera shift to to Yitzchak, and he is going to. Uh, there's a famine in the land. We've heard this before, and he's about to go down to Egypt, right? And God says to him, God says to him, whoa, 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 Al tired Mitzrayim, don't go down to Egypt, as opposed to Abraham. Shchon, shchon beeretz asher omar alecha, live in the land which I will say to you. Gur beeretz azot, live in this land. Veyemach, I'll be with you. Vevarchecha, and I'll and I'll bless you. I'll give you and your and your seed these lands, and I'm going to fulfill the the oath that I that I gave to Abraham. That's the silent partner, right? Right. Like 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 there, Abraham is behind this whole thing. Abraham is blessed, and and I don't want you to go down to Egypt. you and our sages say to us, you're holier than that. You can't go down. You're not supposed to leave this land. He was the Ola Tamima, right? The whole offering. My mom was shocked when she spoke this past Shabbat. Chayesra, she spoke to famous former and maybe future Knesset member Orit Struk. And, and she says, I think I saw you in Fairlawn one time. And Orit says to her, I've never left the land of Israel. So my mom was like, whoa. Whoa. That's intense. <laughs> and yeah. it's by choice, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and he keeps on going and he says, I'm going to uh, make your seed great. Like the the, uh, the the stars in the heavens, I'm going to give, again, your seed these uh, lands, and all of the nations of the world will be blessed by uh, your your seed. And wait, it's important to put a finger on that as well, because this is a repeated phrase. We see it twice. Twice right here. In reference to Abraham. Right. You see it twice right no, here? No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. No, uh, it was... Um, that that he'll give us the, give you the land. It says it twice. In, yeah, but in my, short, my point uh, is is that it's critical to remember that the particularism that we see in this idea that God says, "Yeah, you Abraham, you Yitzchak," even like, and then we start with like Yitzchak and not Ishmael, and and in Yaakov and not Esav. You know, say that particularism is in service of all humanity. That there's something about Am Yisrael sticking to its mission, which is bringing blessing to the whole world. It's it's a it's a very important tension which exists from the beginning yep. and, and needs to be sort of um I think not only honored but contemplated in our day where where people want to make some sort of absolute absolute distinction either you're like a particularist uh, you know tribal thumping drum you know yada 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 or you're an enlightened universalist blah right. blah blah but that's the, well, that's what's so unfair about liberalism today which is I'm always like do you remember that that nationalism was the original was it, right, liberal, liberal force. Right, it was a liberal idea. And like, how, how well, have you totally, you know, well, it's like global the, cooling, the, global warming, global a, climate change. Which one is it? No, but that's the easy, there's an easy answer to that historically is that so long as um, a small group of individuals managed international empires and kept peoples suppressed, so national liberation was a real force for liberation. The argument that the lib or the progressive world is making today is that now those nations are suppressing individuals and not peoples, and so they're for a liberal stance against the sort of national structure, there's there's a logic to yep. it. Yep, yep, yep. That's 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 it. You're, you're, that's good that you're pointing that out. Um, in any case, um, and it keeps going about Abraham here, which is that Abraham heard this beautiful pasuk: "Ekev asher shama Avraham bekoli veishmor mishmarti mitzvotai chukotai v'toratai." And you know, it's funny that he who, kept my Torahs. Where we heard that phrase: "Ekev asher." Shema B'koli. When was the last time we heard that? In Parshat Ekev? What are you referring no, to? No, in Ekev Asher, Shema B'koli is, uh, is, uh, is an indirect reference to the end of the Akedah. Uh, right, 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 There's, right, right. I think, Yan Asher. No, it's Ekev. Right. Ekev Asher, Shema B'koli. Right. You, right? You, 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 Abraham, he... he you, since you listen to my voice, and I will bless him, the blessing, etc., meaning there is a... Who knows better than Yitzchak? Right. Like the that depth, Abraham... The depth of how he listened. <laughs> That's great. That's you know, <laughs> so there's a lot of weight in that line there. That's cool. That's really cool. Which is also where we get the Baruch Huvacha, you know, Kolei right. I just, I just think that, that it's important to know that what you're saying right now is, and it's in this week's Parsha, it's like Yitzchak carries Abraham. I like what you said. He's, he's the silent partner of this Parsha. Right. Yeah, he's he, you'll and he, he repeats himself a few times. You'll you'll find it. And it's like it's like that's what it's really about. Who's going to pass it on? And and Yaakov is going to be the uh, Yitzchak. Yitzchak is the what do you call it? The axle. The um, 
the, the transference. The, oh, oh, it's the, the the bridge between. Right. He, well, yeah. There's there there's a there's a lot written on that right. in, our, in our mystic tradition about the interaction between Avram and Yitzchak being necessary in order to produce Yaakov. Right. Okay. Well, let's keep going. We 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 we're, our time is running and um, he does that. Uh, Yitzchak is in Grar. Grar basically is Grar. Gaza. It's next to Gaza. It's yeah. it's somewhere between Beersheba yeah. and Gaza. In the Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, okay. Guess what? Rivka is very beautiful. Uh, they seem to consider to take her. They never do take her. The the, but the Philistines still takes the, the family precaution of telling everyone she's his sister. Right, he, and then I think right, he would have learned from right. That. But then, well, he does learn. He he does a little bit learn. Avimelech somehow sees, and this is a very interesting verse here, which you wouldn't expect because so far he's a quite silent type of person. But somehow he is true to his name. He is jesting with his wife. What level of intimacy is that? We don't know. But the bottom line is something that was seen by Avimelech, the Philistine, is that is that Yitzchak is jesting with his wife. Obviously, she's his wife and not just a sister. Um, and uh, and uh, he, he, he comes out with a decree. Nobody's allowed to touch this man's wife or else you're going to die. Anyway, right We've after that. We've got a story in my family, says Avimelech, that it doesn't end well. When right, it doesn't end well. Right. Wife. Don't touch this guy's wife. Right. There's, 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 this is probably a second Avimelech. Not the same old Avimelech as in Abraham's time. Remembering if people don't know that the name Avimelech simply means my father was king. Right. Which is a natural thing to name your son when you're king. Right. That's a good point. I didn't think of that. But also, it's like Pharaoh. It's a It could be a title. It's a title. It's probably a Philistine title at the time, but that's a great point. And then, and this is what I tested my kids on yesterday, I said to them, what is the word, ma- what is Masharim? I'm like, first thing, where's Masharim? They weren't tight on that. We figured that out. And then I said, which is in Yerushalayim, it's a famous ultra-Orthodox part of town. I said to them, what does the term Masharim mean? Mo- what did they say, 100 gates? They said 100 gates. And, and I'm like, okay, we discussed it, but then yeah. we really got to it. And, and really, it means 100-fold. And what happened was, is that, is that Yitzchak sowed the land there, and he, and he found that year, or was, it was produced that year, Masharim, which is 100 gates, but it also means 100 fold. Just 100 like measure. 100 measure, right. Okay, very good. Right. Uh, and Hashem blessed them. This beautiful term, Masharim. And of course, Masharim has a lot of gates to it, the, the neighborhood. So it's a beautiful, beautiful name. You know, I called it ultra orthodox, but if you think about it, at like 1850 was the height of Zionism. Right. Right? Because it was the beginnings of the breaking out of the old city walls and really developing Jerusalem. So they wouldn't have called themselves maybe Zionists, maybe, but. Uh, they were just orthodox. Yeah, there was no like ultra, but they were there. also courageous to break out and and, uh, and to start building well, Jerusalem. And let's just say like it is. One thing you have to give to the Haredim is that they're not afraid. No, there are things that they fear. Right, hence the name Haredi, which means to tremble, but it's before God. Yeah, speaking of Haredim, just yesterday I called my. I have I have a few. You know, I have Arab friends that I get all my info from, and I've got my deeply embedded Haredi friends who I get the Haredi info on, and my beloved wife Malka is struggling like so many Israelis are struggling right now with the butter crisis. The butter crisis. There's a butter crisis in the land. It's called land of margarine and honey. Okay. Oh. Because that's right. Because we've got a butter crisis. By the way, I'm I not. I copped a couple of uh, sticks of butter recently. I was okay. very happy about it. Yafe. Okay. So, so for some reason which is beyond the purview of this show and beyond the purview but of if you want to indulge in weird conspiracy theories you can look it up on the internet why there's no <laughs> butter right now you will see the strangest explanations you could ever imagine well, including alien invasions uh-huh. i did not know that i am i am i i know why there's no butter because there's no butter just like there's no rain butter represents god wills no, that there shall not be butter because it's not it's not right now a time of blessing with all yeah. of our uh, problems we, well uh, put it this way Always remember that God never holds back. So the blessing depends on our capacity to receive. To receive. Okay, good. So, so, but, but Landa, yeah, Eretz Zavat Margarina. That's what I call it. Okay. That's right. I came oh, up with that term. That's yes. right. That's right. Oh, no. Uh, Is that what you're going to call the show? <laughs> I was thinking about that. A land flowing with margarine. Yeah, Please land don't. flowing with margarine. That's right. Uh, and, and, but not only is there a butter crisis, but there's also a crisis of Mahadran butter. Yes, because my, the import stuff from Europe is not right. It's not it's, uh, it's Not only made that, from non-Jewish. So my wife bought some kosher milk. butter, and she went crazy and like held back. There, she bought like seven sticks, eight sticks. I don't know what. She found some butter. It's kosher, but it's not mahadrin. She called Tnuva. even the Israeli stuff. You mean? Yeah, she, yeah. Tnuva called her back. And they explained to her, yes, some of this is milked on Shabbat, and usually yeah. mahadrin butter they throw out the stuff here. Yeah, it's not, yeah. Anyway, I, I'm I'm thinking next it's trip to America. It's one of the only areas in our in our in, in our industry outside of meat that that the difference between 
standard Mahajan Kashu. It's actually a fundamental right, a difference. real thing, right? Yeah. Anyway, I was thinking I'm going to go to America and pick up some some you know from from Amber Waves of Grey over there. I'll pick up some Mahajan butter, freeze it, and and, 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 bring, and it. bring it here. You know, give homage to the oh, so the Haredi were, get arrested at the border with butter. That I think that's, that's a slippery not, situation. <laughs> oh, I'm liable to get cooked. Rest. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Give more than a pat in the back for that oh one. Oh my gosh! Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go. Um, what, did I, what was I saying? All that Oh, because, <laughs> because you call your Haredi friends, and ask where you get my butter. Haredi friends are like, we all have an allotment of two. It's like a tenna out there. We yeah. have an allotment of two sticks of butter of Merhadran butter. Okay. The next verse I actually made it's my kids memorize yesterday, and they really liked it. It's verse thirteen of Shlishi, uh, 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 chapter twenty-six. Vigdala ish, vayelech haloch vegadel ad ki gadal meod. The person grew, and he kept going and growing until he became very great indeed. Big, big, big. And that is because Hashem was blessing him. And what happened was is that the Philistines were doing something really bad. What did they do? There's Abraham again. The, the Philistines were, 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 were covering up or filling in the, the wells that Abraham had dug. Now, that's how jealousy... That That's how... I mean, this is. Well, you without, think they were? Do you think they were worried about global warming? That no, no, no. Change, no without, because they were saying if you overexploit the land, and and you, you exploit the wells, we'll all run out of water here. The, the the table water will. Well, I mean, I don't know if they had that global perspective, but it is true that overgrazing. Every shepherd, without having the phrase overgrazing, we know back from when yeah. Lot and Abraham split, there was just an instant recognition right. in every shepherd's mind, like too many of us here. Right. But at, at the same you time, you got to think. Globally, act locally. You know. Yeah. Well, yeah. for sure. Well, they were just thinking locally and acting locally. Which, um, <laughs> but but there there is a uh, there's kind of like a deeper message I think here in between the relationship that Yitzchak has and the relationship that the police team have is that that Yitzchak's mentality is a mentality of abundance, and 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 he's basically well, let's just make more. I'll dig another one. I'll spread out. And the the police team here have a mentality of scarcity, mm. which is that we have to we have to stop this up because if he has it, we don't have it, and it's it, that that's what brings him blessing. That's why it comes to the concept. If you want mea sharim, want a hundredfold increase, you have to have an abundance mentality. I, I really love what you're saying. I really really love what you're saying, and I think that 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 that's actually there's, that's a a key different what's, difference way of looking. I think I mentioned this uh, either with you or with Malka last week, but my sister was at a speech of um, a famous Israeli journalist, mm -hmm. Donna Weiss. Mm -hmm. And Donna says the following. She says, you could tell a person's political... Did I mention this the other day? We on right. our show, yeah. Right. Remember. We, remember we said, we said you could tell a person's political outlook by thinking his time with us or his time against us. Yes. Right? And that's the same thing. Abundance yes. Yes. Or, or scarcity. Okay. Fine. Yeah, but to, yeah, to, to, to Philip Wells, it, it, I think the Torah is giving a, a, a backhanded insult. To the Philistines I like here, it's a direct insult, right? Just well, that, yeah. Well, I mean, it's just it's just a life negating posture. Life negating posture. Very good. I like that. Okay, so so he goes and he's digging wells in these places, and he's he seemingly is a farmer, which is an interesting what do you mean transition. Farmer? He's a shepherd. <sighs> Remember, pastoral peoples also plant; they just don't settle. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I, I I heard it differently, but I didn't understand exactly where it was coming from. But in any case, you don't really see him being called a shepherd anywhere. You don't you don't you don't actually see that. And and we did see that. Okay. In any case, we don't really know. A well doesn't help a farmer. He's not hand watering. Not near to Israel. You wait for the rains. Mm -hmm. These wells are for his flocks. Flocks. Okay, but even a farmer has. Flocks. Okay, I, I'm not sure because it doesn't really say clearly to me. Uh, and I haven't seen where it says that that he's actually a uh, a shepherd. But in any case. He, he digs wells. Everybody's fighting with him about different wells until he finally digs one. It's called Rechovot, he calls it, which means widening. Right, God will broad give places. us broad places in the land. He finally finds a, a kind of a pasture that's peaceful that nobody's bugging him about, and he calls it Rechovot. Today, there's a big town called Rechovot, and actually, it is a very successful town because it has the Weizmann Institute there. And he goes up a little bit north. He goes up to Beersheva, one of the holy cities, okay? And, and God appears to him yet again. It seems like the last time he appeared to him was when he was heading down towards out. Egypt. He right. says, don't go too far further. But then he didn't talk to him all this time, or at least the Torah doesn't record. He comes up to Beersheba, boom, God God comes to him. And it's the Torah uh, underlines Balai Lahu that night. He gets to Beersheba, God talks to him, okay? 
which which says to you about something about the land of Israel, a place where God communicates with people as opposed to outside. Even if you're in the land of Israel, there is within the land of Israel, there's more, you know, more holy, more connected places. And he says, look again here, he says, he says, Vayomer Anochi Elokei Avraham Avicha, right? I am the God of Abraham. And I, it, it, here's that little hint again. Don't work, don't fear because I'm with you. And I'm going to uh, bless you, and I'm going to make you your seed great. Again, Bavur Avram Avdi for the uh, the sake of Abraham, my my servant. I wonder, as 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 a Yitzchak, do you feel a little bad about that? Like, I think there's personalities out there that I don't think he's thinking like, why are you talking about Abraham all the time? I think he's like, no, I I my mission in life is to pass the heritage of Abraham, and I'm cool with that. I mean, like I said, he let his father bind him to the altar, right? At this point, right. he's going to back down from that mission. Right. Good point. Uh, the Philistines come and greet him, and they say, listen to this. This is very interesting. They say, they, they come and greet him, and they say, listen, we kicked you out. Yeah, but uh, he says to them, well, you kicked me out. But they say, well, we see that God is with you. Let us make a covenant. Let us make a covenant. But he does not make a covenant with them. He takes only an oath. He makes a feast for them. And, and he makes an oath as opposed to a covenant. An oath is a lower form than a covenant. Yep. Abraham, they asked for an oath. He gives them a covenant. Mm -hmm. People, the, the, the rabbis, including the Rajbam, others, say, just say, that was a mistake. You're not supposed to give a covenant. Some people even attribute the that, that, that the Akeda happened after he made that decision. Right. Do not sell the land of Israel for perpetuity. Do not allow them to live here. Don't make a covenant with them. They're not people of covenant. You can make an oath of peace, you know, and a, a detente, but not uh, a covenant where you're giving them equal footing in this land. So Yitzchak does not do what they say, pointed out Rabbi Yitzchak at Shalom. He says, look, he says, uh, he says, uh, uh, they, made an oath, they, made, they took an oath, but not a covenant. Okay, and then the, immediately afterwards come the servants of Yitzchak and they told them, yes, we found another well and they called that well Shiva, which, which, which is um, the name of it. And then therefore the, the name was Be'er Sheva, but this time in perpetuity, the Torah says, Adayomaza. we had another time where Abraham also made an understanding with the same Philistines. This time the name stuck and Yitzchak gave the name and he, he inherits that, that chunk of land. He holds on to it, okay? All right, fine. Uh, Asav is going to be taking bad wives. He's going to be taking local Canaanite uh, wives, uh, Hittite wives, uh, and they were troubling. And here's an important thing, troubling to both Yitzchak and Rivka. So Yitzchak, the, the one who loves, I think we may have skipped that Pasuk about Yitzchak loving in past tense uh, Asav, but Rivka loving in, future, in present tense, uh, yeah, loving cool. Yaakov presently. And here we go, big finale showdown, one of the most dramatic. And I'm sure your students here at Pardes uh, struggle with the... Uh, troubled. Troubled, yeah, they got troubled. troubled. By this. And that's fine. We talked about it last week, which yeah, is... It's clearly meant to trouble you. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Anyway, because it is troubling, but it's... But one it's of the things I try to point out to them, if I'm having more than a three-minute interchange around these yeah, things, is yeah. that they are a product of the culture of the Torah, right? So therefore, the fact that they have a moral sense that causes them to be troubled by this text is only because the Torah has succeeded in creating a people who have moral qualms about this, whereas there's a good part of the world that reads something like this and says, yeah, he pulled it over on him. He got what he was after. Right. Okay, well, let's get let's get to the text. And uh, says Yitzchak, listen, I gotta, I gotta, he says to Esau, he brings him in, he says, uh, uh, I, I want to bless you before I die, I can sense the day of death is coming, so now put on your, 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 your tools of hunting, and go to the field and hunt for me a hunt, alright, uh, and make me yummies, yummy treats that I loved, and bring me um, bring them to me so that I could, so that my soul, which actually nafshi in the Torah means myself, my, my, right. my inner self, can bless you before I die. Now, Rivka, here she is again, another verse about Rivka. I told you, every verse. Rivka shomat bedavar Yitzchak. She hears bedaber Yitzchak, that Yitzchak is taking, is talking to Esav. And, she, and he goes, Esav goes to the field, and he goes to bring uh, this hunt. Rivka says to Yaakov, her son, saying, Listen up. <laughs> 
שמעתי את אביך מדבר. I heard your father speaking, אל עשיו אחיך לאמור. I heard him talking to עשיו, saying, bring me the hunt and make for me uh, delicacies so that I could bless you before I die. And now, here's great. See, this is what I mean. Look at Rivka's line. Vata. Not like, ulai, vata. And now, my son, hear my voice. Right. Listen up. Listen up. For, for I am now commanding, commanding you. you. Right? This is not a discussion. <laughs> this lady is amazing. I'm telling you. Lady is amazing. No, no, lelo Jesus, without any... Uh, well, because she's heading him off, because she knows he's going to say, well, wait, and he even does. Okay, but this is a wild plan here. This is a, a crazy plan. plan, and it's Rivka who's behind this plan. Yeah. Um, so, so she says to him, now go get me, uh, two, uh, uh, Zim, two kid goats. Yeah. And the sages remind us here of, of Yom Kippur and the two codes, uh, uh, kid, uh, the kid goats there. Good, good ones. And I'll, I'll make them into the, the, the delicacies I, your father likes. I know likes. what your father <laughs> likes to eat. <laughs> and you're going to bring him to your father and he shall eat. And so he'll bless you before he dies. So Yaakov here, now the, Yaakov says a surprising thing. You'd think that Yaakov would be like, uh, That's not right. Right, he's like, wait a minute. He's Acqu- like, According to your plan here, uh, which is maybe maybe a fine plan, but my, I'm, I'm smooth and my, my brother is hairy. He, he points out the tactical problem, not right. the strategic one. <laughs> right. Which is a good plan, Mob, but one thing. Maybe, maybe, he was, maybe he was pointing that out in order to avoid the... the uh, or, or maybe he appreciated the fact that his mother would not have done this if it weren't intrinsically right. Right. And, and or maybe the, he fears her. Or maybe he fears her. But I, the reason I said that is because I think that the question that lies behind this whole story is what's the standard of measure for right and wrong? Right? Because cause no one's going to be happy about deception. Right? But if you deceive – if she deceives Yitzchak in this moment in order to bring about the proper result – is that what's right? And and there's a so the ends. What's this question? Right. That's exactly the question, right? The ends justify the means. Although right. here it's it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's sort of almost a deeper question, which is well, what is truth? Is truth that the will of God be done in the world, and right. that she knows, having heard this prophecy, that Yaakov is meant to actually receive the bracha, right? And that therefore she's being called upon to overcome a sort like of a narrow sense of morality in order to fulfill this is prophetic sense which is a lot again that's the question that lies behind right. here and, and but there's yet yet, a, yet a, maybe another third option and that that option is uh, the way i see it maybe maybe is that this is a test for yaakov mm-hmm. this is a test of courage it's a rite passage i learned that in like in like where, where was that i don't remember her name but it was an english class and we learned uh, but that wasn't english but she was she was an English teacher that liked French. She was one of those, and she told us "Rite de passage." I You're never like forgot could that. Could just call it a rite of passage. Yeah, rite of passage. I know, but it's not as good. Uh, and I'm sure that Eric is going to reach out to me and correct my French. Oh, he does that to you too. Pardon my French. <laughs> Pardon your Eric. French. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but it is a, but it is a type of rite, and I and I'll and I'll and I'll try to prove it that 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 that. That that maybe not that that they're in cahoots, Rivka and Yitzchak, but there is a type of in order for him to make it in the world, right? He cannot remain the sort of boy in the tent that right. he's and been that, up and to now. And that goes to your uh, to your point earlier, which is he's in development. Yes, this is a okay. critical turning point in right. this process. Critical, okay. And by the way, he's going to pay a price. The yeah. deception element that happens here, he will have to fix. N- no doubt. Before this process is over. That's right. Okay, so he says, okay, she. Uh, so he asks her, maybe my father is going to touch me, and I'm going to be a, a trickster in his eyes, and he, I'm going to get a lie, I'm going to get a klala, I'm going to get on myself a, a curse and not a blessing. The whole thing is going to go, fuck her, it's going to go the other way, and it's going to be you know upside down and not the desired result. She says to him, v'tomer lo imo, again, Rivka, every, every phrase, she says, alai klala bni. Unto me is your curse, my son. Now, some rabbis explain, by the way, that Allah, Allah is, a, is an acronym for the three curses that he's going to get in life. Those three challenges, Ace of, Lavan, and Yosef. Mm-hmm. People explain that. And, okay, and there's more to that. But in any case, uh, she says... I'll Ach-shma. take it. <laughs> she says, but you, now, but, do what I told you. Now, do what I say. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> so... So, uh, so anyway, he goes and he, and he brings the, uh, the, the, uh, it's interesting. She could have taken, by the way, the goats herself. Obviously she wants him in the story. Yeah. And by the way, I also feel it's interesting that the, the emphasis in the 
troubling aspect of this story for most people is on Yako's behavior. When in reality, we should be asking the question on Rivka. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Rivka's the main player here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, anyway, she takes her son's, her other son's clothing, seems like his special clothes. There's a lot on this in the Midrashim. Right. His special clothes, maybe his hunting clothes or maybe his... At his age, his mother's still doing his laundry. Right. Let's face it. <laughs> It's interesting. He's though. married. Remember, he's got two he, wives. He's got two wives. That's right. But he does not like the softener that they use. That's right. So, they don't know how to get the high. That's bubble. right. That's right. That's right. Too much starch. <laughs> too much starch. And you don't want to get on Asaph's bad in side. The boar hide. Right. Okay. So then, so then, uh, she puts these special clothes. She also takes on Yaakov. She also takes the hides of these goats. Uh, these goats, by the way, are, as you can see, very economic. She's also going to make the food out of them, but also going to use the the uh, the for hairiness disguise. for disguise. And uh, she gives it to uh, uh, the what, what she prepared. She gives to Yaakov, and uh, he comes into his father's tent. He says, uh, and he says, "Vayomer Avi, Vayomer Hineni, Miatabni." He says, "My father." He says, "I am here." That's the famous Hineni again. Of the of the Akeda, which you talked about, who are you, son? Right from the get go, the smells a rat. Yeah, it's a suspicion. So Yaakov says, "I, um, I am Asav, your firstborn." Now there's a lie and a truth there. And here I I noticed that Rabbi Etchalom did not bring this up. The the lie is that I'm Asav. The truth is I own the birthright. Right. And I have a right to say that. That's a very important point. Yeah, sure. It's a very important point. Okay? I have done as you have said, which is not exactly true, uh, because I didn't go for a hunt, and it's not really me, Asav. Please set up and eat from my uh, from my hunt. Not exactly the truth. So that well, you're so... Uh, right. Okay. Right. I, oh, maybe that's what it is. Now you've, you've closed the thing. Go get them. Even they're in the uh, cages... He has to bring them. He brings it to you him. You got to bring it to yeah. You you got you got to take yeah. You got to catch those. You know, bringing a goat. By the way, if you go into the what's it called the pen, it's not so simple. You got to. He knows that. He knows that slaughtering look in your eye. Yeah, exactly. He's like, <laughs> I don't want to kill me you. For a walk right I now. just want to make you kosher. <laughs> what movie is that from? Oh, that's from the Fisco Kid. Come on, what kind of question? <laughs> okay, is that? all right. Last, by the way, I want to say that many about five people wrote to me that they knew what my riddle from from the mocker part of the show of of what was in the basement of the alamo which is which is of course peewee herman's bicycle okay oh god that's, that's right peewee herman's bicycle or really the real answer was that peewee herman's bicycle is not there because there is no basement to the alamo and my friend ari silverman all the way from barcelona wrote in be like i grew up next to the alamo and i know it has no basement i'm like of course it doesn't that's the point when peewee herman gets there there is no basement there. okay uh, there is no basement as well all right Anyway, back to holy things. Um, <laughs> meanwhile. Meanwhile, anyway, Yitzchak says to Yaakov, come closer to me so I can feel you if you're indeed Esav. And, uh, and, and, he sa and, he, and he touches him and he says, the voice is the voice of Yaakov, but the hands are the hands of Esav. Now, to me, this is actually the first of the blessings. You got the voice of Jacob. You got prayer. You got thoughts. You got deep stuff. You're the man of the tents. You've developed, you know, th the deep thoughts, right? Yeah. But your hands are the hands of Asaph. Like this is your first act that I know of that you are that you're engaging the world. Yeah, you're actually trying to build the world, right? And you and you're being, you're getting dirty. Yeah, you're getting dirty, right? You're you being can't in, build the world without getting your hands right, dirty. It's that's just right. a, and that's part of the reality that is happening here. Meaning there will be negative consequences from this act. Okay, and right. he will have to live with it, and not only live with it, have to work it out. But in the end of the day. He's doing what's right. Right. And he offers his father food. Notice, by the way, that suddenly out of nowhere, there's wine. Right. There's wine. And he offers him always. Some, there's always wine. And the wine, I like how wine appears in the Bible. Just when right? you need it. It's like, oh, look at that. Conveniently located. Look at that. A goat wine right here. Look at that. That's great. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, oh, you just reminded me. Um, okay. So he says to him, let me kiss you. He, he, he draws closer to him. What does he smell? He smells the, the, the scent of the field. And he says, you are my son that has been blessed by the scent of the field that, that God blessed him with. And he gives them this blessing. And this blessing is, is very, very famous. And it starts, we say it Saturday nights. A lot of people say, Have a gvir 
and that's it. He, he, he like a litany of really blessings, very physical blessings, physical blessings of the land and, 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 and the produce of the land, not a mention of Abraham here or anything like that. In any case, he gets the, 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 the bracha. I'm only rushing a little bit because of time. And, and he exits. And you could hear the music now as Yaakov exits the room. He says, I'll take that. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and, and who comes in? But Esav, okay? Esav is going to come from his hunt, and he also prepared uh, the the uh, the uh, delicacies for his father. And Yitzchak says, and Yitzchak says, "Who are you?" Uh, and he says, "I am your firstborn son. I am your uh, your bechor, Esav. Is that a truth or a lie?" Half and half. Half and half again, because in truth you are Esav, but you are not, not the firstborn. Right. You sold that. That was the oath. Okay. Oh, but Yitzchak has a deep moment of uh, fear. Yeah, what's another word? Tr trepidation, like like trembling. Oh. Yeah, trembling. Yeah. And he says, "Who was that other guy who who, who hunted a hunt man? and gave me food and and uh, and and before you came and I blessed him?" And here's a key line: "Yeah, he shall be blessed." Like I accept that. I accept that he 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 wanted that blessing. He well, wanted not only that, that it actually remember that it, it was received because because Yitzchak is handing on something which doesn't just purely come from him. He's a channel for a divine blessing, mm -hmm. and he says, "Well, and it and it worked," which is what poses the question in his mind of, "Wow, maybe the trembling is he just got saved from doing the wrong thing because he had intended to give that blessing to Esau." Right. This is a very complex moment for him. It's a very complex moment, and then then there is one of the I think. If you hear it, it's a bit of a scary moment. It says when Esav heard the words of his father, he cried umara ad meod. He cried a loud and bitter cry. Yeah. If you hear it, if you tune into it, yeah. it's still there in the world. Oh well, no, you, you, you can hear that loud and, and bitter and, cry. And the sages say that that in Achivo Meshech Tidkeno until the Messiah comes, that we're going to be paying the price for that cry. Right, and that's what I meant. Not in the sense of punishment in the sense that they, they sometimes you do what you do because you need to do it because it's right but don't kid yourself about thinking the fact that you're not going to damage things along the way that you have to fix before the story's over and so so it's not a question of means justifying the ends it's a question of this is how the process was given to you to do but don't kid because when you say the reason i hesitated around that when you say the means justify the ends it means okay the ends like whatever i don't bother you with those moral qualms no what i'm saying is no you're right this was painful for Asaph. It wasn't okay for him. And yet he's going to carry a burden from that for the rest of his life. And right. therefore, so will we. Right. And nevertheless, it was right. So then right. how do you make it in its fullness? So we actually have to fix that somehow. Mm -hmm. Right? You can't just say the means justify the ends. And therefore, what do I care what happened through the means? It's not what we're saying. Right. And, uh, and I heard also an explanation that, that, that Mordechai is going to also cry a bitter cry. And that's because Haman, who's the... The descendant. descendant of of Esav is going to do this horrible payback. thing. Payback. This payback. So so yeah, it's uh, you're right, and it is 100 percent complex. Like enjoy the complexity. Yeah. Like, like like struggle with the complexity. It's okay. In any case, Yitzchak ends up giving him a a a tight blessing, a shorter blessing, uh, and he says, "On your sword you shall live, and your brother you should serve." But it was when your brother will will throw off his yoke, won't be exactly who he's supposed to be. You will be on top of him. Okay. But there's going to be there's a flip flop here. There's a um, not flip flop, a uh, inverse relationship. Right, 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 uh, right. Th that that if Yaakov, in, in simple terms, if Yaakov is not going to be doing what he's supposed to be doing, and he won't deserve that right, then you will get what you deserve, which is the right to lord over him. Which is why one of the reasons that it makes a lot of Jews uncomfortable, but it's worth saying it. One of the one of the ways we understand anti-Semitism and the oppression of the Jewish people is that we're just not on mission. Right. We're not on mission. If we were That's on right. mission, then we wouldn't have these problems. Right. Uh, and he says in his heart, uh, says Esau in his heart, when my father's, when my father's life will be, will, when my father will pass away, I shall go kiss. I, kiss. Yeah. I should, oh, that was weird. Yeah, we'll come later. Right. Uh, I will go kill uh, Yaakov. I'll go kill Yaakov. Again, back to my favorite character. It was told to Rivka, obviously prophetically, the words of, of Esau, her oldest son, she calls Yaakov and she says to him, your brother wants to kill you. Okay. Now listen to me again. Get up and run away to Levan, my brother, to Haran, uh, back back to uh, southern Turkey over there, uh, to my family and sit there only just about a few days. I'm finishing up with just by a few days. 
we'll meet that term a few days later on when we talk about Rachel, until your brother's uh, anger will subside, until your your brother forgets what you have done to him. Thanks a lot, Rivka. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, and, and then she says, why should I lose both of you in one day? Two different explanations. Either it's going to be Yitzchak and then Yaakov, or then or we also learned that Yitzchak and uh, that Yaakov and Esav were buried basically on the same day. At least the head of Esav and the body of of Yaakov. We'll get to that later. Um, in any case, um, it's a cliffhanger. It's a cliffhanger. He leaves basically on the run. He's on the run. He's on the man run. on the run. But importantly, and I can't finish off the show without this this part of the show. In any case, that Yitzchak invites him in and he blesses him again and this yeah. time instead of the blessing of financial and field uh, and, and earthly blessings he gives him that blessing of abraham the very famous very beautiful words hashem, the, the god of fertility hashem like that name of fertility shall bless you and give you many offspring and you'll become a what how do you translate kahal amim a community of nations. Congregation of nations, community of nations. Right. They'll give you the blessing of Abraham. You'll get the blessing of Abraham and to inherit this land, the land of your sojourns, which God gave to Abraham. And, and by the by, the fact that this happens now, I think illuminates a lot of what was going on before. Why did Yitzchak want to give the bracha to Esau? Because he knew that Esau could make his way physically in the world. Right. And that that was a critical beat kibul, was a critical vessel to receive. He looked at Yaakov, he said, sweet kid, really sharp, spiritual, but he's there in the tents. He doesn't know how to make his way in the world. He's not a vessel that can receive this vision of what Avraham's promise was. Now that he gave him that physical blessing and also saw that his could make his way in the world quite well. Now he's ready to receive right. the promise of Avraham. And, that, and, that's, and that's, I think, the first part of the blessing, which is the voice is the voice of Jacob. But hands, you gotta have you gotta have Asavian hands. Right. That's what builds the world. That's what builds the world. All right, Rabbi Mike Foyer, thank you so much for joining me here at Pardes uh, in Jerusalem. It's a beautiful day. May God give us uh, a, a real sense of this narrative. May we feel that we're the continuation I mean, uh, of Abraham in this world and get through the hiccups that are happening in the world right now. Maybe even more than hiccups, this little kind of moment. Birth uh, pains. Birth pangs that are happening right now. And lots of blessings to you. Shabbat shalom. Thank you so much. All right, folks. More great stuff is on the way. Again, I didn't get to all of your emails, but we will. I promise. I still have all of them on on file. Thank you, Gmail. Uh, And in any case, uh, Maka Fleischer is next. The land of Israel is calling to you. The God of Israel is broadcasting to you. And you are awesome for being tuned in. So stay tuned. More great stuff is on the way. Shalom. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Yishai Fleischer Show, broadcasting from Judea this half with our beloved Malka Fleischer. Malka, welcome to the show. Thanks, Yishai. And How are you feeling after a big Shabbat at Chevron? Well, we had the bat mitzvah, and yes. then we had uh, I had a trip to America for the David Harwood's Freedom Center weekend in Florida. Right. And then I came back right into Shabbat Chai Sarah, which is the major event on the calendar for the year. This is all after Sukkot also and all that. Right. And also the preparations for the bat mitzvah. So all that together, frankly, I am very, very pleased and, and very, very satisfied, but also a little bit worn out. And uh, and I'm looking forward to a Sabbath a now, uh, a Sabbath, which is not a work Sabbath uh, like last week, which was which was really awesome. And I mean, it is also incredibly inspirational. 45,000 people in Hebron, uh, great VIPs, great program that we run, a lot of work with the army, with the police, with logistics, like toilets, 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 toilets. You got to bring toilets to Hebron for people to be able to use that's the toilets. That's one thing that they, I think they do not so bad. Right. No, we've, we've. But it's that's not like the oldest practice ever. It used to be that they did not bring in these toilets. And then. We brought toilets, but we brought it half was as much. Bad. About three years ago, we were like, we sat down or two years ago, we sat down. We're like. We've got to just double the toilets. Yes. And we just doubled the toilets, put a lot of nice toilets, and also doubled the amount of people who are cleaning and taking care of it. And Good this, call. this also costs a lot of money. We pay for all that infrastructure. Right. And it's not like people pay for tickets to get into Hebron or something. It's no, free. You come, no. you get in the tent. Yeah. In fact, it's not just free, but but there's a lot of uh, chesed, a lot of uh, 
free food that goes that yeah. that's given out and and thousands and thousands and thousands of shekels and dollars are given into uh to feeding people there's this huge huge rows of like pastries and barekas and all these different things that that come out for kiddush for people and free meals that are given out i ran into somebody of we isha you and i really ran into a couple with a child who came and they're like we're just standing on the steps going up to Maratamach Pela. We run into these people and they're like, hey, um, so like, where can you go for like some food? And we're just like, you know, it's Shabbat and you have no plans, right? And they're like, yeah. It was Shabbat already. Yeah, it was Shabbat already. And they're like, yeah. they're like. No, but they were also like. And where where some food? And they're like, well, where do we sleep? And we're just like. <laughs> Are you kidding? And then they're like, no. And we're like, and they well, were older. They were not. Yeah, like with a, a with an older child. Also, anyway, they were they were cool people, and I guess they figured it would work out, and I'm sure it did. Like yeah. we are, we turned them toward people who could feed them at least. I mean, every single like little piece of floor space is usually taken up by by some kind of mattress or something of, of some guest who showed up. You know, you know what? But, uh, but I'm sure Hashem took care of those people. I mean, a lot but of that, people... but what I wanted to say anyway is that that's kind of like what it's like a little bit in Hebron. I mean, a lot of people, they make a good plan and they bring food and they bring tents and everything. But it is a little bit of a like on one leg kind of trying to manage the the situation as it is as it happens well i don't want i don't want people to get the wrong impression it, it is a, a giant festival and people come out very very satisfied very happy and yeah, very it spiritually was beautiful uplifted um and most people make a plan either they bring their tents or they get some apartments you call us in the in the month beforehand we, we hook you up with apartments there's also right apartments. but the week before people were, were yeah. calling which is normally a r very reasonable thing to do right who makes plans for shabbat like months in advance right but in this case, it was hard to find people, places to stay. But even that, I saw that Hashem like took care of different people. There was a one person I know who really wanted to go and she couldn't find a place and this and that. And suddenly she's like in a class with somebody and somebody knows somebody and suddenly she has a, a place to stay. Right. Now we had, a, I got to hear the Torah read right in front, right in front of the Maratha Machpela. The weather was beautiful. We, of course, read the Torah portion that we talked about last week, which is, uh, the Torah portion of Chai Sarah, you get to hear the um, the purchase, the the negotiation and purchase of Marat Machpelah right there, and it, it's very very moving, very meaningful, and just people walking around. My mom was just she was with us also. She was just looking at people. Yeah, it was she fascinating was just, to see all the people decked out in their Shabbos clothes, but also sleeping in tents. Right, right, and you see also it's pretty amazing, you know. I don't know how many of you do camping. We do a little bit of camping, but not a ton of camping. So it's always a, it's always impressive to see how people like set up their home right. in their little tent for one day. Right. And people bring out these big pots full of cholent that they prepared ahead of time and their sleeping bags and tables and salads and like... People really made themselves like a beautiful Shabbat there in, in their camping. Right. And now right before Shabbat, right before Shabbat, we did something special. It was an idea that I had, which is to make a poster that said, uh, that said, thank you, uh, President Trump and administration uh, from the Jews of Hebron. And that was the poster that I made, a big one, you know, like three yards across. Yeah, it was a nice big like... Uh you know, parade type poster, right? And and right before Shabbat, or an hour before Shabbat, got a, got a few hundred people to kind of uh, surround the uh, this poster, right? And and took a picture with it and Marat Machpelah and put it on Twitter right before Shabbat, and it, and it absolutely went. And I think yeah, ben it went Shapiro, viral. It has it has two thousand likes, right? It has uh, uh, almost four hundred and fifty shares. Does it have two thousand or is yes, it yes two thousand two thousand two k? I see a two k here. Nice. If you guys aren't our friends on Twitter. Then that's where we, if we, if we had to say that one of our social media platforms was like our most active social media platform, it would be Twitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you got to come hang out with us there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 fun and and we're always we're always snarky and fighting and fighting and snarky. <laughs> um, I also want to mention one other thing that happened over Shabbat. Uh, because it's important to mention it, and also because it got covered in the media, and that is that there was some violence uh, that took place between Jews and Arabs. There were some Arab on Jewish violence that we're kind of used to, sadly. There was also some Jewish on Arab violence, and uh, the the 
the Palestinian media went, uh, you know, took that took that all the took way. Took that story and ran with it. Ran yes. with it and ran with it and ran with it. I mean, it. I guess it is news, right? It's not that it's not news. Well, they didn't but they run pushed it because it. of they, news. They run it because they wanted to create an atmosphere that right. these settlers are violent and all that kind of stuff. Right. Even though none of the violence was from local residents. Right. It was. It, it was, was all uh, people from outside. You know, there when you're setting up basically an entire city, there was there was uh, how many people? I mean, estimates range. Uh, it, it's around which, 45,000 people it's around 45,000 people which and is a ma which is a huge city full of people right yeah. so there were a couple of people who were unsavory unsavory and and frankly young and drunk right some of them and and they threw rocks including a rock that 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 hit a baby according to reports uh, a Palestine, an arab baby and uh and all i have to say is that is Extremely regrettable. We're 100% stand unequivocally against that kind of action. We work with the police and with the IDF in order to make sure that does not happen. We have called for the police to make arrests or whatever they need to do vis-a-vis -vis this thing. It is extremely against our interests for a few reasons. First thing, our festival, which I call Woodstock Meets the Bible, and which was quoted widely in the media, uh, is... Um, is exactly that. It's Woodstock meets the Bible. One of the things that was very famous about Woodstock was that really the police had no work. There were there were hundreds of thousands of people, and they were just there was just peacefulness. That's what this festival is about. It's about our historic connection to this land. It's about Abraham. It's about love. It's about a lot of things, but it's not about violence. That's just not what this thing is about, and it just ruins our reputation. So we don't want it. Second thing is when you're violent. Now, now I'm not here decrying against all violence. There are times when you got to push back. When you got to make your presence felt, all that kind of stuff. There are times when the ar army, which is really organized violence, has to act, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, but throwing but, rocks at random right, babies is not is exactly, any kind of violence that right. any person around here stands for exactly. whatsoever. We are 100% against That's exactly what I'm getting to. We're 100% against that. And here's the other part of it. We actually have to live with our Arab neighbors the next day. Right. And you usually do it with very little problem. That's right. And and so to have these folks... Uh, now, there was also block throwing by, by the Arabs. There was lots of stuff. There was a video that came out yesterday about attacks on soldiers, all kinds of stuff. But the bottom line is, is that we are unequivocally against that, that kind of action. Now, a, re a, a, a supposedly reputable news source, I'm not going to mention which one, but a supposedly reputable news source, which I don't think is that reputable, um, wrote an article saying, basically just aping and mimicking and 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 re re, re uh, what's it called repackaging the Palestinian news sources, and it was just like, it basically made it look like forty five thousand people got together, a bunch forty five thousand hooligans got together in in Khalil, the Arab right, name for Hebron. Right, just to Hebron, make trouble for make nice, trouble. normal people right. living in Hebron. Well, I had to call that, I'm talking about an Israeli news source. I had to call that Israeli news source and was like, you didn't even quote. The J-Post, on the other hand, quoted me very widely, explained how we're completely against it, but this other paper just was like, just didn't even have one quote explaining or, or, or minimizing or giving another perspective, anything. I called them. Gave him a piece of my mind. They called me back and wrote a paragraph into that story. They left the story as is, a nice, you know, anti-Hebron story. But there was <laughs> there was a uh, there but it was wasn't a, just straight up Hamas newsletter propaganda. Right, exactly, exactly. Uh, Malka, uh, you and I, right before the show, I know that one of the things that y you and I really believe in is that it would be so amazing if the culture of Israel would. Would be like the Bi would follow the readings of the Bible. For example, Chayesara, right. you go to Hebron, uh, Vayetze. Uh, right, there should be week. festivals. Right, there should be, and it's easy to do. This -ish. this week should be Beer Sheva. This is There's the Beer Sheva week. The Bible week. places throughout our country. We're not even talking about the the Bible heartlands and stuff. Let's just think like marketing wise. Places throughout our country are being highlighted. In the book that like a lot of people are reading every week. Right. And because of that, we could be highlighting those different places, bringing tourism to different places, bringing awareness to different places, um, you know, helping uh, create a positive, unified cultural environment in our country uh, by making cute events, cute, not just cute, but also meaningful events and fun events, educational events, uh, sporting events, any kind of thing. All throughout our country, in the different places, in the Torah right. portion. So of the this week. week, this week, the Torah portion highlights really the main city that's highlighted. This week is Beersheba. 
and it gets its final gushpanka, its final like signature name in this week's Torah portion. And, you know, Be'er Shev, it's such an amazing place. People don't think of it as a biblical place, but it's one of the hearts of the Bible places. You know, Isha, I happen to know that the chief rabbi of Be'er Shev was in Hebron for Chai Sarah. And I think, it, I, I don't know if Hebron, Hebron doesn't have a chief rabbi, does it? No, we don't have a chief Hebron rabbi. Hebron should have a chief rabbi. That's interesting. But if well, there we was have a... Rabbi, we had, we had, of course, the we famous had rabbi, rabbi, rabbi Dov Lior, right. who just happened to a few years ago move to Yerushalayim. But, well, uh, so now you're, right. you're plumb out of a chief rabbi. Right. So I think that it, it's also a good opportunity for, uh, you know, the the towns to respect each other. The chief yeah. rabbi of Hebron should yeah. be going to Beersheba for Shabbos. And, yeah. You know, make connections. Speaking of chiefs, my good friend, our good friend, Alex Trayman, yeah, uh, who's, a, who's a long, long time friend of mine, worked with me at many jobs. He just came back from, from America. He's now the uh, managing editor, I think, of JNS, News Source, Jewish News Syndicate, uh, and a great paper. Uh, I'm very proud of it. And <laughs> Alex, no. you know, Alex has got, you know, he can pull off things that nobody else can pull off. So he has himself now an Indian's hat, you know, like the Indian baseball team. Yes. With with the Indian chief on the on the on the front of it. That's Chief Wahoo. Okay, that that's the name. Now they're getting rid of what? that. Yeah. Do you know? Oh, the, are they getting rid of that? symbol? They're getting rid of that symbol Aww. because it's like because it's offensive. Because it's offensive and a little bit silly and all that kind of stuff. And I remember in law school, we 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 uh, we covered some cases about Redskins, the right. Redskins team, and this and that. But anyway, Chief Wahoo is being being uh, phased, out. phased out. But Alex got himself a Chief Wahoo hat, and he's so funny because there's Alex with his big grin and Chief Wahoo on his head with his big grin, and it's just it's just a it's just he made me really laugh, and I and I just want to do a shout out to him and, and his good work. If if you know what I'm talking about, you know who Chief Wahoo is. Maka, you can look it up on the computer. You'll see why it's funny. Mark is looking at me with uh, okay, but anyway, just just a just a um, shout out to my buddy Alex, uh, doing great work uh, at JNS, and do check it out. Uh, you also write there, JNS Monka. You write uh, great articles as well, and uh, I'm thinking about maybe having a column there or something like that. We'll see if that happens. In any case, uh, the other thing I wanted to so so this week is Beersheva. Next week that's told out is Beersheva. Next week Vayetze is Beit El. Uh, Vayishlach is uh, is both Beitel, but I think it's also Shechem, like Alon Moreh Shechem, because that's where the whole Dina story happens. Right. Uh, maybe we should go there because our uh, good friends Natan and 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 Karen Shachar, uh, they're out in Alon Moreh doing great job over there. So maybe we'll when we miss them, unless yes. because they had a Mazal Tov birth. So well, um, that's actually be, we didn't miss them on Lechacha because they had a Mazal Tov birth. We missed them. On Lechacha because we had our daughter's bat mitzvah ah. coming up just right after that. I see. Okay, so there you go. That's why we miss them. Uh, but regardless of why, we so should, maybe we we should catch go up there. there. And I also was just before the show talking with you about, imagine if there was a Bible-themed restaurant. Like, I like the idea of biblical burgers, okay? And then you can have the Asav one, you know, the bloody one. Ew. And it's like... I don't little, know if a ground it meat... Is, uh, know you know, more, but more red sauce, you know, more right. red sauce. I thought we could have the Yaakov ladder fries... You know, fries shaped you like a You're giving away all of our secrets. How are we going to make the money? Well, I want other people to come up with foods. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. What would Bible you serve? Okay. Bible-themed foods. Okay. Every week we have a hashtag, but it's different this year. Yeah. This week. This week you need to come up with cool dishes for our Bible-themed restaurant. Right. Right. Like, what? what is it called? What's the name? And what's the food? Last time I ate at a Bible-themed restaurant was... was what? You ate at a Bible-themed we restaurant? We were in Tinek. Holy, holy, oh, holy yes, Tinek, yes. Noah's Ark. But it wasn't, well, Wait, it wasn't, okay. It wasn't, there wasn't a Bible theme except for the name, yeah. but it started raining, and then one, somebody said in our big party group of people was like, look, it makes sense, we're Noah's Ark. Right, and that was cute. I thought it was that a was cute, cute little yeah. moment. But like, definitely, I would I would definitely have uh, the Leviathan fish sticks. <laughs> uh, you know, I would have, I, I would have, uh, you know, I don't know, Mrs. Lotes. uh Salty pretzels. Salty pretzels. <laughs> you know, come on, folks. I don't want to give... Wait, oh, don't think of them all, Isha. you got to give people a chance. That's right. That's right. Nah, I mean, you know, th there's just many, many, many options. So I want to hear from you. Uh, hashtag Bible food, okay, or bi or biblical theme food, okay, or Bible burgers. Hashtag Bible burgers. And I want to hear from you what 
Bible foods you would what what Bible themed foods you would come up with? What do you think, Malka? Cute, exciting. Like, All yes. Right. All right, it's been a it's been a long and awesome show, Malka. Oh, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, one more thing. Oh, what? Oh, phooey. got it all confused. Why did I have the thank you Trump and administration thing? No. What for? In Hebron. Why? Yeah, it was about. It wasn't just a general pro-Trumpian thing at all. Yeah. It was specific. Yes. Pump. Uh, Secretary of State Pompeo came out with a statement saying that they're they're uh, um, doing they're away. They're undoing. The Hansel, the Hansel Memorandum of 1979 under the Carter administration. They should call it the Gretel Mem Memorandum. That's right. The which new is, Gretel Memorandum. Which is all about what? Which is all about saying that that according to the United States, the United States position is that Israeli settlements in, in the quote-unquote West Bank are illegal under international law. And he said that is no longer the case. The United States has is repealing that Hansel Memorandum. And this was in, 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 that was all in legalese, mm -hmm. boil it down, equal sign. According to America, according to yes. the United States position, the settlements are legal. Right. That's in, under international law. And I was so excited a about A lot this of Malka. Israelis were so excited by that. But I was just, I'm, I'm talking about I'm me just saying it's second. not, no, I just want to, yeah. people to know that it's not like some kind of uh, outlier that was excited about this. Right this thing in israel it was like a big celebration across israel across the political spectrum people were very happy with this absolutely absolutely but you know isha i you had these 107 house democrats uh in the u.s congress who wrote a letter of rebuke to pompeo and you know all the articles focused on this idea that 107 congress people wrote an wrote a uh, a letter rebuking the state department for saying this because international law really says that Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria are illegal because Jews are occupiers, etc. Right? But I read the article, and this is something I didn't really see um, in a lot of the articles, which is they didn't just denounce um, this recent statement of Pompeo of of the State Department, the U.S. State Department, uh, undoing this this distinction of Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria is illegal. They denounced basically. The entire pro-Israel policy of Trump. I want to read this. This one, uh, I think it's one sentence or run-on sentence. They express their strong disagreement, right? Uh, and then they say this. This announcement, the State Department announcement, following the administration's decision to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem outside of a negotiated agreement, its closure of the Palestinian mission in Washington, D.C., and U.S. consulate in Jerusalem, and its halting of aid Congress appropriated to the West Bank and Gaza, has discredited the United States as an honest broker between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, severely damaged prospects for peace, and endangered the security of America, Israel, and the Palestinian people. So really, it's not about this particular announcement right. it's not that these 107 d democrats which by the way are not are approximately 25 percent of congress meaning to say 75 percent of u.s representatives wanted nothing to do with this mm -hmm. this letter but 25 percent of the house representatives signed it and their problem is basically with any pro-israel policy that trump has done at all they don't want pro-israel uh, policies from trump they want obama policies for israel um, and I think that that's important to note, meaning to say there, there, there's, it's, it's unreasonable. It's, it has nothing to do with a, a you know, a, a clinical analysis of whether, you know, the communities in Judea and Samaria are legal, which one could obviously now analyze as not true, right? That, that the communities are legal, but rather that they have a problem in general with the idea of doing any of these um moves which suggest that israel has a sovereignty in its land um i think that they worded it carefully saying it was the things that prejudiced the negotiations with the palestinian authority i don't think they're calling for in that letter for anti-zionism they're saying look all these things that undermine uh, you know israel's discourse with the palestinians is is what we're against and i think they were very careful in wording it that way because they didn't want to get snagged up in 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 you know something that would be considered anti-semitic in their mind trump is being anti-palestinian uh, listen uh, you know to me all of those moves were, were excellent moves and and that palestinian authority is really a 
machinery that 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 uh, pays money to terrorists and is and, and educates towards hate of Israel and, and and is a is a ethnic cleanser wherever it goes. But in their worldview, that's the way they see it. They they see that that it's to prejudice this thing that they fought for, have tried to to move forward on both under Carter, Clinton, really also Reagan and also Bush and certainly Obama for for the creation of a Palestine. And yes. Yes, they're absolutely right. It is being systematically undermined, and we are systematically applauding that. Yes. Okay? That's exactly we because we, we, too, want to undermine the idea of creating a Palestine on the land of Israel. And that's another thing. We have to say it clearly. I even see people on the, on the nationalist side who don't say it clearly. Here, let me say it clearly. I don't want to see a Palestine in the land of Israel. I am against a Palestine in the land of Israel. I am 100% going to do everything I can to stop from the creation of a Palestine in the land of Israel. Whatever Palestine already exists in the land of Israel is already a very bad thing. It's bad in Bethlehem, it's bad in Ramallah, it's bad in Shechem, and it's been cer certainly bad in Hebron. It is a bad phenomenon. Israel should be the sovereign in these places. And that these people will have to find them uh, a, a way of living, uh, some kind of status, which is maybe residency or Jordanian citizenship, et cetera, et cetera. There's many other things that we've discussed. But I want to say clearly, I am 100% against the two-state solution or any formation of a Palestine on our land, including in Gaza, which is what has happened and has been a, a, such a tremendous uh, source of violence and, and terrorism and, and destructiveness against Israel. So I, I find that people don't say that clearly enough. And and the Trump administration has not said that clearly enough yet. Well, okay. they've said they're it, not it, going to say that, right? Because 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 we're the that. ones and have to we, say that. Because yeah, we can't say it. If we right. can't say it, it's almost like the United States is leading the pro-Israel policy today, which is on the one hand neat. It's on the on the other hand, it's insane, right? And it's embarrassing. It's, it's like insane. why? It's sad. Why? Why should it be that that we need this guy over here to like give us the courage to do what we should be? very courageous to do it's i'll say to you this one not cool president trump is ahead of the state of israel but there's one more group of people that is ahead of the state of israel and that's the so-called settlers and so we've been ahead of our state for a long time holding on to this part of land saying that palestine is a bad idea uh, being against hamas etc terrorism saying that we should be the sovereigns here we've been doing that from the get-go it's president trump he's just matching our speed he's a tad behind us Okay, but he is way ahead of the state of Israel. Uh, in any case, uh, Malka, I want to thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I want to thank everybody who's out there listening, and I want to bless everybody. Really, I want to bless you personally. Whatever you're listening to, I could feel that you're on a highway somewhere listening in, in, uh, in, in your car or you're jogging or washing dishes or walking the dog or whatever you are. I just want to give you a lot of blessings from the land of blessings. That's a special Shabbat of Toldot. Uh, and I want to ask for one more thing, which is hashtag pray for rain. Yes. Okay. I want to ask everybody. It's too beautiful up in here. I want everybody to please jump on the bandwagon here. The land of Israel has not received its winter rains at all yet. And it's time for, for everybody. Right. It's really late. It's, it's time for everybody to get on the ball and get on the prayer uh, uh, prayer bandwagon here. And let's go. We, we need the rain. So we turn to you, Hashem. We say, please, Hashem, get, you know, bring us the rain to the land, uh, rain to the land of Israel. And we turn to you out there and say, you know, turn to turn to the turn to Hashem and, and ask Him, uh, because it's time for these uh, beautiful blue skies to become overcast. With that, uh, with that note, I want to uh, leave you and thank you again, Malka Fleischer. You're awesome. Ditto. Great broadcaster. Great, great lady. Great, awesome <laughs> uh, mom and wife. And uh, everybody should 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 have a, a mock in their life, and oh, if they can't have a mock in their life, it. at least enjoy the Yishai Fleischer show, where where um, where they where they get to enjoy your wit and wisdom. Wow, Yishai, this is the best ending of any of your shows ever. Indeed, it is. So I will not tarry any longer and just end there. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Lots of love from the land of Israel. Shabbat shalom.